Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to another seminar of our, our series, uh, uh, the UK SBS seminar series. Uh, the meeting is being recorded, so if you uh, don't want to appear, uh, you know what to do. At the, at the very end, uh, we are going to give an opportunity for off the record questions as well. So. Uh, if you don't want your uh, voice to be recorded as well, uh, uh, you can ask questions. If you just wait, uh, we'll give an opportunity for that as well. Um, I'm uh, very happy that today we have uh, Natalia Bielova, um, who is uh, a, a tenured research scientist at INRIA, the French uh, National Institute for Research. Uh, and uh, she's an expert uh, on uh, uh, user privacy and has a multidisciplinary background in computer science and law. And uh, today she's going to uh, cover a bit of uh, both uh, angles. Uh, she was uh, a senior privacy fellow at, uh, the, uh, at CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority, the, the GDPR. Uh, enforcing authority in France uh, between 2000, uh, 2021 and 2022 as well. So that would be interesting on top of all the other sort of academic achievements uh, that she has had. Um, and uh, currently a European Data Protection Board invited expert as well. Um, many of you would know Natalia from her uh, 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 extensive publications at uh, uh, top security venues, uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, uh, venues such as uh, ACM Chi. Uh, so in that sense, I wouldn't add uh, to this uh, uh, introduction and uh, uh, leave uh, and, and ask Natalia to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Semak, for a very nice uh, presentation and introduction. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with you, even though it's virtually. Um, and I'm very happy to present and share my, my work with you. And please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, be aware that they will be recorded if you do it in the middle of the talk. Um, and when you ask your question, ideally, I would like to see your face as well. That would be very nice. <laughs> OK, so let's get started. Um, so my work is on privacy protection for users on the web. And uh, I am an INRIA tenured researcher and I spent, as Simak said, uh, one year at the CNIL. Um, and uh, my main interests are uh, in measuring, really large scale measurement of web privacy, application of privacy law uh, on the web. And also since uh, some years uh, working with uh, design scholars on dark patterns and user manipulation. So all this work would not have been possible without my amazing collaborators. And I hope I listed everyone here. So these are my PhD students, my interns, postdocs, and my colleagues. Um, among them, I have uh, two colleagues who are uh, legal scholars and uh, one uh, researcher in design uh, with whom we uh, have been working for some years now. All right, so my work started with my interest in web tracking. So let's imagine that the user opens the website, three different websites, one for ordering pizza, one for checking weather cast, and one for visiting their doctor's website. And we know that on this website, there are these trackers, right? So they are collecting information about the user's um, activity on the web and building various profiles depending on how often these trackers are present on the websites. So today there are hundreds of such third parties that are collecting data at scale of, of the users and there is around 1 billion of websites. But what is missing in this picture is are also the end users because for every website we also have a very large uh, audience of people who are visiting them and overall there are 740 millions in, in the EU. So I'm trying to protect privacy of these people while looking at the technology and also understanding the legal implications of this work. So what is web tracking? 
Well, it's a technique that allows the operator of the website and its partners to recognize the user, the visitor of the website when he or she comes back. And there are two groups of tracking. Roughly, there is a within site analytics, within site tracking uh, um, uh, kind of group that allows um, the website owner to collect only the browsing history within this one website. And this is often called the audience measurement. And there is another group of tracking um, that is called cross-site tracking that allows to collect the history of the user across multiple websites where this tracker is present. So in the research on the web tracking, um, people have taken various directions, but I believe that there should be at least three main characteristics, three main steps that should be done in, in the area. So the first one is measurement. So when we actually analyze Web, uh, web tracking, detect web tracking at scale on multiple thousands of websites with large scale analysis. We can also perform target studies where we look into particular type of sites or particular types of tracking. Um, and uh, when we do that, we have to consider in order to make a real impact of this work, we have to consider the issue of compliance. So to understand which kind of laws are applied uh, to the system, and I'll discuss in a minute that in here it's in privacy and, and GDPR, and also discuss the potential violations. Um, I want to share with the community this, this point that it's very important to say potential because when computer scientists are saying we are detecting violation of GDPR, that's not really correct because only the judges can say that it's a violation in a courtroom, right? And we are not the judges. So I think this is something important that I will keep on reminding through my presentation. Finally, when we understand the potential violations, I think as computer scientists, we have to also provide tools like evidence collections. And in case of uh, research on the web, there, there are often uh, browser extensions that can help visualize the kind of problems that the researchers have, have found. So in my work on web tracking research, I started like many people in this domain by doing large scale measurement and detecting different types of web tracking techniques. So in this area of web tracking measurement, people have analyzed various kinds um, of uh, web tracking techniques. So one of them that I'm sure all of you know are third party cookies. Right, and these are uh, the cookies that are used to identify users across sites, um, and they are often blocked uh, by browsers today. But there are many other techniques, like uh, cookie respawning, when these cookies actually reappear because they get stored in different uh, browser storages or browser cache, or um, browser fingerprinting. There is also um, cookie synchronization, when various companies exchange these identifiers um, between them. There, is, there are also more sophisticated techniques like CNM tracking or uh, even first party cookies now are used for tracking. Um, so, but what's common across all the research in the web tracking um, area is that most of the works um, detect trackers using filter lists. So these are lists that have been curated over years by the community. And they are used a lot in the browser extension. So I'm sure you will realize, recognize some of them here. So Firefox and, and Brave are using uh, the filter list, but also the uh, extensions such as Adblock Plus uh, or uh, Disconnect, they are all based on um, specific filter list to detect triggers. So in our work, work we decided to um, actually built a, a crawler and ident we managed to identify six types of tracking behaviors. And when we apply this very well known and used filter lists um, on, on what we've uh, detected, we found out that actually they miss around 25 and 30% of trackers. And uh, I, I'm not gonna guide you through all these categories. You can check our paper if, or ask questions if you want. I want to just show you one type um, that we discovered, and this is called first to third party cookie syncing. Um, we, we found that this particular type of tracking is, is quite bad because it helps companies to synchronize the identifiers and to build richer profiles about the users. So I want to guide you quickly on how this works. So let's imagine that we have um, a web browser 
where the user is visiting a certain website and there is a cookie database where we have already a cookie from one third party. Here, it's a hypothetical example. It's doubleclick.net. Um, so when the website um, gets loaded in the browser, it fetches the script from, in our case, Google Analytics. And the script sets a first party cookie, uh, which belongs to the website we're visiting. And normally, this cookie will be used for uh, collecting information only within this one website. So it's much more privacy preserving than cross-site tracking. However, um, this Google Analytics uh, script also shares it back with its own server, allowing the, the Google Analytics to actually track the user within this one website. What we found out is that oftentimes we have also new requests uh, HTTP requests, right, that are being sent to the third parties, like in this case, DoubleClick, allowing this a company to synchronize the first party cookies that are more privacy preserving and the third party cookies that are used to build a very rich profile. And this happens only with one request from your browser to the server. So when we looked uh, deeper into this, we found out that this behavior of synchronizing cookies of first and third party is present on 68% of the websites. And this is really huge. Um, so this is one of, of our findings. And what was very surprising, so we've published this paper in, in summer uh, 2020 at PETS. And what was very surprising is that just some months later, we saw a sanction coming from the CNIL, from the French Data Protection Authority, on the website of Carrefour France, which is a big supermarket chain in France. And of course, you don't need to understand French, but what this, this decision was saying is that they found first party cookies of Google Analytics. They found that this cookie was synchronized with third party cookies, just like we found in our research. And moreover, this type of synchronization behavior requires consent, which was not asked um, in this case. So that was quite shocking because if we actually offered a browser extension on time that would demonstrate the results of our finding, probably uh, a data protection authority could detect such violations with ease and maybe even at scale. Um, okay, so uh, this is what we did next. We, we decided that, well, it's important not only to do the measurement, um, but also to uh, collect evidence from, um, from the users, sorry, from, from, the, from the browsers. So that's what we did next. We actually decided to build a browser extension that we called Ernie. Um, and this extension detects these six different cookie synchronization types that we have identified in our paper. So you, you can check this extension yourself. Unfortunately, so far, it's a very, it's a, a research prototype. So it's a, maybe a bit hard for uh, general public to really understand what it's doing. So we are actually building now um, uh, a new version that should look more uh, easier to, to understand. All right. So um, uh, as I said, I think from, except for the measurement, we have to think about compliance and we have to think about evidence collection. Right. So in our next work, we decided um, to look into uh, a new type of web tracking technologies and then consider um, where there are compliance problems by collaborating with the legal scholar uh, Christiana Santos. So here again, it's a rather technical work, but in this paper, we have decided to look into two big categories uh, of uh, web tracking technologies. So for a, a tracker to be able to track the user, um, there should be two uh, kind of steps. So one is the ability to store and create the identity of the user in the browser. And the other one is the ability to communicate this user back, identity back, right? So it's quite easy when it's done with cookies, but there are many other uh, techniques to do that. And roughly, Every time when this identity is stored in the user browser, like in the cookie or in the, some other browser storage, this is called stateful tracking. And when this identity is not stored, but instead it's created from different properties of the browser, 
like the operating system, the uh, even the IP address, the screen resolution. Um, this is called browser fingerprinting, and <clears throat> it's considered stateless, right? So there is no state in the browser. However, each of these techniques have their own downsides. So the stateful tracking is great because it's stable over time. Once it's stored in the browser, it's there, right? Um, however, the storage can be cleaned. So the user can have this uh, habit of cleaning their cookies from time to time. On the other side, the stateless tracking doesn't require any storage, which is good, but it's not very stable over time because whenever we are traveling or we are even changing from home to work, the our IP address changes, where we use an external monitor, our screen resolution changes. And so the identifier that's created from all these properties of our machine is not stable, it's changing. So we started wondering what happens if the trackers actually benefit from both stateful and stateless tracking? What if they combine somehow these two techniques to make their, uh, the, the, the tracking persistent over time and, and, and stable? So how would this work? So we imagine that this could work if the cookies could be respawned with the use of browser fingerprinting. So let's imagine this hypothetical uh, example here where we have a script that uh, belongs to tracker.com, right? And this script uh, and the tracker.com is setting the cookie uh, 1234 in the cookie database of, uh, in the browser. Well, the script can actually um, collect also all the uh, information about the browser and the operating system, create a, a fingerprint, which we call here FP456, and send it back to the tracker. So the tracker now can have this matching table matching the cookies from the, in the browser with this fingerprinter. So, well, what happens next? Well, the user can clean her browser and normally that would help to prevent recognition of the user again because there are no more cookies. But since the fingerprint doesn't change in a very short period of time, right? it can be sent again to the tracker. The tracker can revoke the uh, identity uh, of the user, which is 1234, and set it back in the cookie database, right? So this technique um, allows to use the best of the two worlds, right? So both the cookie and the fingerprint and kind of recreate each other. So we decided to understand whether this happens in actually on the website. So we set up this complex system that I'm not gonna describe in all the details, but uh, we tested the dependency of the cookies on eight different features, uh, fingerprinting features. And we've implemented this complex machinery where we first detect cookies that are seem to be specific to the users. And then we made a permutation test, testing for every feature, whether uh, actually, um, we have a proof that the particular cookie depends on that feature. So overall, when we tested this on 30,000 websites, we found that on 1.4 of them um, actually collect, uh, sorry, contain these cookies that are respond thanks to the features uh, of, of the browser fingerprint. And this happened on around 1,000 websites. So as I said, this is great to do such research, right? To find the problem, to measure it at large scale. But we were also interested in understanding what the, is there any legal problem with that, right? With using these kind of techniques um, that actually uh, relies um, on, on two different tracking technologies. Well, when we worked with our uh, colleague who is a researcher in law, we found out that there is no explicit legal interpretation of cookie deletion. So when the user delete cookies, there is no legal meaning of that. But there are other principles in GDPR that actually uh, apply here. So one of them is that the personal data must be processed fairly. And we found out that, well, when the cookies are respond in that way, then the legitimate expectations of users are not respected. We found out that the transparency principle of GDPR is also violated because uh, personal data processing must be handled in a transparent manner. 
Um, so what we did to test this is we analyzed uh, top 10 popular respond cookie owners, and we found that um, the policies, the privacy policies or cookie policies describing uh, the use of these cookies do not mention um, uh, that, that this technique of recreating cookies when browser fingerprint is used. And finally, a lawfulness principle that requires the websites to obtain user consent. Um, we found that uh, for 130 cookies that, that we could categorize with a specific uh, kind of service, um, actually do not comply with this principle. Um, I think before I switch to kind of a next area, do, are there any questions on this rather technical uh, part of the talk? Okay, I think I'll continue then. I, yes, yes. Any question if I can, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, so my, my question is on the um, on the use of, of cookies, and uh, when you reset the cookie based on the fingerprint, I can I can understand why you I mean you want not to do that because the user think it was delete deleted right so you should respect that, but mm -hmm. how can you prevent the tracker from just creating another pseudonym for for you? I mean, have you thought about this? This is, is it possible? Right. So the tracker can create a new pseudonym for you every time, right? Yeah. So yeah. They, they can do that. The problem for them is to be able to link these pseudonyms uh, across sites, right? All oh, right. So this is the problem for them because if, if they have one pseudonym on per site, it doesn't give much insight, right? I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, makes so sense. That, that's what I meant when I talked about uh, synchronization. Because right. the synchronization allows different companies to exchange these pseudonyms. And then on the server side, they can all merge the profiles, so everything they know about the user, right. or sell the data to each other. It's just enough to know that they are talking about the same person. Mm -hmm. And given that they have no data about our names and surnames, they have this just this pseudonym types. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Welcome. So I can ask. Oh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Natalia, hi. Uh, hi. So. Ah, uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. So. Uh, uh, so basically, I was wondering that uh, had it been the case that uh, uh, the cookie deletion by the user is also informed. Yeah. So, so what I mean by that is that if a user deletes a cookie, and hypothetically he informs uh, the uh, the website that I have deleted it, then would it be still uh, sort of you know under or violating some kind of a compliance that uh, uh, fingerprinting can be used to sort of detect uh, uh, or recreate that cookie? Yeah, that's what we we found out, and we actually even asked some of the data protection authorities informally, right? We said there should be some legal meaning, right? If I delete my cookies, it means I don't want to be tracked, right? I mean, that's what we, at least I would perceive as my wish, right? But no, there is no legal meaning of deletion of cookies. It's just, you do something with your browser. There is no legal consequences of that. So no, if- no, but, but yeah. uh, so, uh, so in the current setup, uh, if a user deletes a cookie, he doesn't inform the website that I have deleted it and recreating is uh, recreating it would be violating my privacy, right? So this is behind the scene that I, I, I deleted my cookie, but the website is not even aware of it, right? So he thinks that, uh, oh, okay, you know, I have already deployed a cookie on his uh, machine. And then if I try to even, you know, fingerprint him, it's totally fine because I have already deployed a cookie. But it, he, the, the website doesn't know that I have deleted the cookie. So you my know, they, intention they is do, not- They do know, they do know. And what we found, um, if I go back quickly to this picture, um, yeah, that, that was the setting, right? So they, what we found is that they do they receive the fingerprint. They do not receive my cookie because I cleaned it, right? So in this request. Ah, I see. That is what I was asking. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay, and so what they do is they actually recreate in the cookie. So they set it back, even if mm. I deleted that. Right, right, right. And where does the mm. same origin policy fit in actually? Um, so so what here, the, what, Yeah, what does that prevent? 
so the, the same origin policy here doesn't do much because we are talking about um, we are talking about third party cookies that are set in my example here they are set by the response from a third party and same origin policy applies only to scripts that are running right right okay so here it's just the script that initiated the request but then the server sent the response and that's yeah. it when the browser receives the response with the set cookie header if the browser doesn't block third party cookies it will just store it right yeah 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 yeah, but we do have we, we do have a more sort of discussion about the um, the owners of the sorry I'm just yeah about the owners of the of the third party uh, cookies and and the scripts who are involved in this process uh, I'm not I don't have time now to go through all of that but you, you can check the paper yeah. we do have a specific section on that yeah yeah, um, right. yeah. yeah. okay yeah, so. thank you yeah thank yeah. you okay. I think I'll continue unless we have some other questions. Okay. Yeah, so then we, we had also done a lot of work, uh, not on the very technical side of, of tracking, but on the content banners. So we call them content banners because um, the, I'm talking about this banner that you see on the website when you visit them. The other researchers are calling them cookie banner, cookie notice, content notice, cookie pop-up. There are many names. Um, in my work, we decided to call them consent banners because they implement the legal requirement of consent. Uh, and it's not just about cookies. It's about all kinds of information that is stored or retrieved from your browser. So, um, yeah. Uh, and so I think that in this area, we have to perform very similar kind of steps, right? So we do have to look into measurement, but here we will have to measure um, a, a technical storage of consent and respect of the choice. We can technically measure the UI elements of the consent banner interfaces to reason about the legality uh, and the validity of, of this consent. And again, we talk about compliance, of course, a lot, because in this space, we have to know um, when the consent banner is, is compliant. And again, we can do uh, evidence collection. And, and I'll talk about this in a minute. So when we talk about consent, it's, um, required uh, by the e-privacy directive and GDPR. And uh, in, the, um, in the web ecosystem, we now have these actors called content management platforms that are providing the consent banners uh, as a service. So we've done an extensive amount of work in this space. Um, I'm gonna try to cover briefly uh, many of the findings that we have. So before starting looking at the consent banners, I actually, this was the first point where we started collaborating with Cristiano Santos. Um, and my question to her was, how can we know that this banner is compliant? Um, well, first of all, we need to know that to reason about this area, we have to know that the GDPR, but also the e-privacy directive applies. Because GDPR covers personal data, but the e-privacy directive covers information that's stored on or retrieved from devices. Um, so basically, when we talk about web tracking, <clears throat> the e-privacy directive requires consent before information stored or retrieved. And then this consent is defined in the GDPR where the conditions for consent um, are, sp are stated for it to be legally valid. But of course, when we talk about law, it's not as, uh, you know, it's. Uh, there are always exceptions. So when we talk about web tracking technologies, uh, they do require consent unless they are used for communication or strictly necessary to enable the service requested by the user. Which means that when we try to address the question of when web tracking can be compliant with the law and how to detect the non-compliance, we first have to know the purpose of each tracking technology. And basically, by analyzing legal literature, we understand that there are purposes that exempt it of consent and purposes that are subject to consent. Um, but detecting each tracking technology is already complex and knowing purposes is even harder. So we've done a, a preliminary study identifying purposes for each tracker. And we found that um, it's very hard and it's very complex because 
uh, if we only looked at a very well-known third-party cookies, only 13% of them are present, are named in the cookie policies, which could help us to find the purpose, right? And only 5% of them are, are expressed in very readable tables where we could identify, okay, this is the cookie, this is the purpose. So it's extremely hard. Um, and it's actually a big problem, I think, in, in all the large scale measurement studies because this purpose is, is not known. So, however, if we just take an assumption that we only cover the area of web tracking technologies where the, the purpose is subject to consent, then we have to answer the question of how can exactly we can verify that these um, uh, con consent pop-ups, consent banners, are actually compliant in, in the web applications. So to answer this question, we have started working with my legal, uh, with legal scholar. And uh, well, if we read GDPR, we see that there are basically seven adjectives describing uh, how when consent is valid. But by analyzing further a lot of other uh, literatures, we found that it's actually a very complex question to answer. Um, and in order to audit for compliance, we need to do measurement to detect web tracking technologies, to identify the purpose, and then to apply other tools on top of that. Again, for those of you who are interested, uh, I invite you to read our paper that actually was my first paper in the legal journal um, that, that we've published together. Um, so we found out there are 22 low-level requirements for consent pop-up uh, compliance. And we analyzed the binding legal sources like GDPR, e-privacy, but also the European Court of Justice decisions. We analyzed non-binding sources like the guidelines from the European Data Protection Board and other uh, national DPAs. But in some cases, we even had to apply our own interpretation, either legal or computer science, because there was no uh, very clear guidance uh, in the legal literature. Uh, I just want to show you one example uh, that we identified while doing this research, which is what we call correct consent registration. Um, so this was found out when we decided to analyze websites that implemented this particular um, consent banners provided by the consent management providers that I mentioned before. Uh, and we found that there are 54% of websites that contain at least one suspected violation. So for example, we found websites that do not respect the choice that people express in their consent banners, or that the consent is stored before they actually made their choice. So we were um, very lucky that one of us, uh, Celestan Matt, decided to uh, implement a browser extension that demonstrates what kind of consent is actually stored in your browser when you interact with the consent banner. Uh, so with this extension, we talked with NOIP. So it's an NGO uh, led by Max Schrems that um, decided to file three different complaints to the French Data Protection Authority using our, our extension. And uh, it created actually a lot of noise around this uh, consent banner ecosystem. Um, and in the end, we found that, well, we, th we think we have an, a, a bigger impact um, beyond the three complaints made to the CNIL, because when we went back and we checked uh, popular websites that we have mentioned in our, in our own website or in, uh, in Twitter threads, we found out that all of them have fixed uh, their consent banners. So after that, we decided to look in the area uh, of so-called gray zones, when the consent banners do not necessarily explicitly violate um, the legal requirements, but still can be considered harmful or, or manipulative. So to do that, we set up a, um, a collaboration with Colin Gray, who is a researcher in design and is known for his works on, on dark patterns. And we decided to discuss when we have issues with dark, of dark patterns and uh, legal requirements on content banners. And we took the interaction and criticism perspective where we looked from different uh, point of, from the point of view of different actors in this ecosystem, trying to understand when the dark patterns and legal requirements uh, interact together in, in, in the space. So to do that, we have designed a constant task flow 
where we imagine the user journey here from top to bottom, um, uh, who is interacting with the content banner. And for each of the steps, we identified uh, legal requirements for valid consent, but also the uh, strategies uh, with dark patterns. So I'll, I'll just show you one example. Uh, what we call a consent wall is a technique that many websites use today. They block the access to the website and ask the user to make their choice. So this is uh, oftentimes presented as with both acceptance and refusal options, but the website is blocked. So when we discuss this from legal side, uh, well, actually GDPR asks for consent to be easily accessible, but it should not be unnecessarily disruptive. And from the design point of view, it's actually confusing and is disruptive. Um, and, uh, and there is a certain tension between the user interaction and easily accessible consent. So as of today, it's still an open question whether this can be considered uh, illegal or not. But what we also identified here is a, a one type of a dark pattern, right? That is, um, is a force action and it's obstruction. It's obstructing the access to the website. Um, are there any questions so far? I've seen because I'm going to, again, diverge a bit of my, of my talk in, in a kind of new area. You feel like you've got just to go back to where you introduced and used the word purpose. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, that gave me a bit of a problem uh, going into another area. One doesn't talk about whether a gun has a purpose. One talks about whether the manufacturer of the gun has the purpose or whether the user uh, or the uh, the stealer of, uh, of the gun has a purpose. So not the gun itself. And you were using purpose. I forget about what now uh, exactly how you used it. But it seemed to me that uh, the exact uh, the analogy I just given you uh, uh, fitted. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. Le luckily, you then stopped using purpose and uh. consent, uh, and um, uh, I then uh, lowered my hand. <laughs> no, no, that's a good question. I, I think I hope I answered this. Um, so I'm using purpose in a very legal sense. So oh. in GDPR, there is a, a lot of use of the word purpose to say that when data, data is collected, the personal data is collected, it should be very clear what's the purpose of the use of this data, right? So when a company decides to collect personal data, they have to demonstrate how they're gonna use it for what. And that's what the purpose is in the legal sense, right? And it's always on the shoulders of the company who is collecting the data. So data controller again in, in legal terms. And, and, and it's very hard for external observers like researchers to understand where is this purpose, even though there is an obligation to uh, demonstrate this purpose. Yeah. Okay. I hope I answered the question. Sorry, there is some I can't words. remember exactly the word that you used, it first used in association with the word purpose, but it doesn't mm -hmm. fit the, the, uh, the case you've just talked about. It fitted my example of does a gun have a purpose? Mm. Well, I, I didn't go in my talk explaining really the legal definition. Yeah. So yeah, but thanks for asking. Yeah. Okay, fine, bye. I think, yeah, no. thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. So yeah, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about dark patterns. So uh, let me ask you briefly, uh, how many of you heard about dark patterns? Anybody? Maybe, I don't know if you can raise your hand here or something. Uh, if I have a look at the participants. Okay, not, not so many people, all right. There are a few, yeah. A few, yeah, okay, okay, I see. Right, um, so, so dark patterns actually became a very, uh, well, quite known, uh, uh, um, uh, term, right? Because it actually is a, is a technique that's used uh, to coerce or manipulate users uh, towards certain decisions through normally the interface um, of the system they are interacting with. And uh, and again, this is one short definition. We can find many others in, in various uh, literatures. But today, dark patterns became a concept 
that is discussed a lot in the legal space, in the policy space, in the design space, but also uh, within the HCI community, uh, it's a very hot uh, keyword right now to, to do research on that. Um, and also in, in psychology, because dark patterns are using oftentimes the cognitive biases of the users in order to drive them towards certain choices um, that they are going to make in, in their uh, interface. And uh, actually, the, the word, the, the first, uh, well, dark patterns actually emerged as a concept um, around 2010. And since then, numerous uh, researchers have tried to, ident to identify the categories and types of dark patterns, trying to describe them better, to give them definitions, and also to group different types of dark patterns together into higher categories in order to organize this big space. So there are... Uh, five actually um, very well-known works describing different types of, of dark patterns and given definitions. But this concept of dark patterns became also very well, became, became very interesting for the regulatory and policy discussion where the European Data Protection Board, the Competition and Markets Authority, the European Commission, OECD, FTC have published their own reports describing dark patterns and providing their own taxonomy, their own definitions uh, of dark patterns. So what we've done recently with, with uh, my colleagues, Colin Gray and Christiana Santos, is uh, we have collected all these different definitions into one big board, um, combining 245 of them that we found across all these uh, literatures. And we proposed a draft ontology grouping these definitions and also tracing when exactly they were these are cited and mentioned specifically across the literature. Um, uh, and, and we decided to propose this to the community as, as a big uh, organization right, of this space. So in our ontology, we define high level dark patterns. We describe the strategy um, that is used uh, in, in the dark pattern. The meso level that also describes the angle of attack. So this uh, higher level um, uh, dark patterns are domain and context agnostic. And then we have low level patterns that are domain and context specific that describe the means of execution. So for example, there is a high level strategy of interface interference that has a specific angle of attack of manipulating the visual choice architecture and a specific mean of execution is a false hierarchy. Um, so in this work, we have identified six high-level uh, patterns, 24 meso and 34 low-level patterns. So our ontology is preliminary, um, but we hope that we are providing now a shared vocabulary, both for the regulators and for dark pattern scholars, and enable more alignment in the user studies and sanctions and discussions of, of harm caused by these dark patterns. Uh, we hope that uh, for scholars, we help them trace the presence of different dark patterns of the time. And for regulators, we hope to give them uh, the, this vocabulary to help them anticipate the presence of these patterns, either in new contexts or domains, or even to build um, automated detection. So as I was saying in the research on constant banners, we also, uh, we, we did uh, work on, on the measurement, we did work on the compliance, but I think we think what is still needed a lot is the evidence collection. So for some um, uh, very technical uh, issues, like the one we found out with the consent storage and respect of choice, um, browser extensions can help. But for other type uh, of issues, like the one I showed uh, about uh, manipulative design, we believe that there should be other types uh, of evidence. And one of them could be um, user studies, right? So regulators and policymakers then could use the results of such studies uh, to, to, to set up um, uh, very clear rules on when exactly the, the banners can be manipulative. Um, so we have decided to look deeper in, into this area. 
So on one side, when the interfaces of constant banners are regulated, the, the first, uh, the first they have to be compliant with a high level EU law requirements from GDPR and the privacy directive. But then um, this design space is still huge because the requirements are quite high level. So in order to, to narrow down this design space, um, the EU uh, regulators set their own guidelines explaining which kind of designs would be considered compliant. And also we have binding case law that describes when the content banner designs are not compliant because this case law gives concrete um, decisions. But the design space that they are limiting is very, very small because it's very specific on the one specific type of a banner. On the other side, we have a research community that started looking into these manipulative tactics and dark patterns. And they have started building user studies, empirical user studies that try to quantify how each particular um, design parameter impacts the decision making of the users in these constant banners. So we decided to look deeper into that. And we first analyzed um, regulatory literature between 2019 and 2023. So we've identified that there are um, uh, 14 guidelines that actually have been updated in Europe uh, about uh, content banners. And there are two um, documents from the European Data Protection Board that also define which kind of practices are considered compliant. So we collected and analyzed all this literature. And on the other side, we looked into the academic literature where researchers are building uh, online experiments with thousands of users, um, identifying when exactly the users uh, would be manipulated by certain types of, of, the, of the design. So we found out that in the latest years, there are 11 user studies who have done that in the field of HCI, security and privacy, social computing, and also EU commission report. Moreover, these studies uh, were done in various countries, in the US, in the UK, Germany, and, and others. So we have collected all these sources. On one side, 16 EU regulatory guidelines. On the other side, uh, user studies. And we tried to understand uh, where exactly, uh, how, whether they are talking about the same kind of designs and whether they are agreeing or disagreeing. Um, however, it was very hard to do this because the uh, regulatory guidelines do not describe uh, the consent banners uh, very, very precisely, very structurally. It's, it's all uh, described in a very uh, kind of, uh, well, in, 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 in text, right? So it's, it's a bit hard sometimes to extract what exactly is, is considered uh, compliant. So in order to reach the gap between these guidelines and the user studies, we've decided to identify the content UI sections for which we have then extracted on one side the requirements and on the other side the results from the user studies. So we basically looked into the three uh, UI sections. So the main banner text uh, that is present almost on every website, uh, on every banner, uh, the what we call bulk controls that allow to either accept or decline all at once and specific controls that are often given to user to choose per purpose. And by purpose here, we will see, you see often on websites that is uh, provided, uh, the type of purposes can be advertising or uh, audience measurement uh, or uh, others. Okay, so what we've done is we took actually each um, content UI section, we have identified design parameters and their implementations of what exactly, how exactly they could be implemented and which dark patterns um, actually could occur if this implementation um, uh, is present in the banner interface. So by doing this research, we identified 11 gaps between the suggestions of the EU regulatory regulators and the results that were conflicting these suggestions of the regulators. For example, um, the regulators say that uh, main banner text 
must contain multiple types of information because of the legal requirements. But the user studies found that there is no significant effect of the banner's text on the user's decisions, suggesting that this requirement is not very effective in this context of, of consent banners. We have also identified five insights uh, for researchers where um, there are some parameters that are not explicitly um, uh, measured in the existing studies, or there are some issues in the existing studies. So for example, we found that the guidelines support a specific control per purpose. And one guideline even has an example, like the one you see here, um, where users could choose per purpose and then this, so click one button to submit this. We found out that several user studies have tried to evaluate the impact of different designs about the specific controls, but some of them included also the accept all button next to the submit button that would already nudge users towards acceptance and it would not be considered as a neutral uh, design. So we hope that this work uh, that actually has been just presented um, last week at, at the Harvard Law Symposium uh, and discussed with the legal and computer science researchers. We hope that this work um, actually helps the regulators to understand that they should consider the results of user studies uh, in order to provide guidelines that are aligned not only with the law, but also with expectations of the users. And researchers could also provide more evidence on some specific aspect that we have identified in order to help also harmonize the guidelines because we found that many of them actually provide different suggestions of what kind of banners should be compliant. Um, and finally, we discussed uh, an idea of, of a development of standardized interfaces, which we think are needed um, because this could help harmonize the application of the law across the EU but also could initiate discussions about compliance and usability uh, of the consent banners within other countries where consent is needed. So we have multiple uh, types of impacts of our research. Uh, we are continuously given, providing feedback to the regulators. So we've done this for the French DPA, EDPB and the Italian DPA. Um, and our work uh, on dark patterns have been cited in several reports by OECD, European Commission, and other authorities. Finally, I want to bring my perspective to, to the community. So I believe that the evidence collection is the key. So as computer scientists, we have to build tools like browser extensions, crawlers, or um, other tools, or make user studies, right? Um, in order to provide the evidence that is so much needed for the data protection uh, regulators. And uh, well, we actually have the same goals, right? So privacy researchers develop these tools and DPAs investigate, and they need to have either the tools or the evidence. Um, finally, I really uh, advertise <laughs> um, uh, and, and invite you to collaborate with the data protection authorities uh, and regulators in, in your country. Final point, um, I also have one postdoc position available if you're interested in this type of work. Thank you. Women, women. Uh, I have a question, please. Mm. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, to do with dark patterns. Uh, somewhat related to my pre in previous question, in fact. Dark patterns surely are the other side of the coin um, to the quite big subject in psychology and in, in business, which informally is called nudging. Yeah. Uh, nudging happens to have normally a good purpose. Dark patterns have a bad purpose. Um, but it seems to me that there must surely be an awful lot to be learnt by um, uh, comparing the work in those two areas, mm -hmm. regardless of, of purpose, and stealing ideas from one area to the other. Yeah. That's yeah. normally a very effective way of doing research, finding out that what you're working on is already known by some other name. Yeah, uh, now, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we are aware I just of wondered, yeah. mm -hmm. I just wondered whether there'd been any effective use 
or linking between these, I'll call them, communities. Mm -hmm. I think there is already a link because the community of, of, who works on dark patterns are very mm -hmm. much aware of the work on nudging. Okay, good. And, and this is, yeah, this is described in, in various places that, that, yeah, indeed dark patterns are exploiting um, the, the biases, right, and the, the habits of users in, in, a, in the opposite direction than nudging. And sometimes people even call it sludging. Yeah. So mm -hmm. nudge and sludge uh, is the, the opposite of nudging. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that's happening. I hope it is happening with papers uh, making it explicit mm -hmm. rather than people mm -hmm. writing pairs of papers, mm -hmm. if you yeah. see what I mean. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank yeah. you very much. I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you, but thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we have some time for other questions and then uh, if you want to ask a question off the record, we, we will give some, uh, uh, we'll leave some time for that as well. While we're waiting, can I ask uh, one, one question? You, you mentioned uh, uh, that it seems that sort of all of your experience in this area has led to towards sort of the, the importance of collecting evidence. And uh, that sounds uh, uh, very interesting. What, what was your sort of uh, experience in terms of collaborating with the, the and also working for uh, data protection authorities in terms of how well this sort of experience, uh, evidence, this collected evidence is, is sort of received and, ha and uh, wanted? Uh, yeah. If, yeah, so I, I think in general, regulators have very strict rules and procedures about collecting evidence, right? It, it's very well documented. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's not that straightforward, you know, to come as a researcher and say, okay, here is my evidence, take it. You know, so I think uh, in, it depends on the case. It depends on the area. In some cases, like in, in, in web tracking, um, this evidence that we collect is not enough because it's, you know, there are some elements missing. For example, purpose that I mentioned already has a very strong legal uh, meaning and we do not have the data. So we can come with the evidence, but it's not enough. So in this case, I think we as researchers have to build tools like, like the extensions and say, okay, here's the extension. Do you want to use it? You can collect your own evidence with that. Right, so this is one case, but the another case is the user studies, right? When we have uh, researchers who run very big empirical evaluation with thousands of users in a certain country, which is already difficult to, you know, set it up already. Um, and in that case, you, you can't replicate it so easily. I mean, you can, and I think this is something that the researchers could be doing together with the regulators is to perform such studies but this is not something where you can just give the tool, right? And in that case, I, I think that the, the evidence explaining the results can be useful too. Sure, thank you. I think Tom has a question. Yeah, uh, uh, that was really fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna ask a philosopher's question. Go ahead, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm interested in, in the fact that all the legislation about, that you're, you're looking at about the collecting of tracking data uh, and particularly through the use of cookies and fingerprinting um, is framed as privacy legislation. And it covers a lot of things which are definitely about privacy. Now, it, insofar as people are unaware that someone is collecting this much information about them and processing it in a way that creates a profile which they can then be used commercially usually for advertising purposes. There's something wrong that, you know, they, they, they will feel uncomfortable with that idea. But it's not obvious to me that it's a privacy violation in the same sense that we might think that um, uh, the state, uh, so in the UK, we have the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, which means that all internet service providers have to keep uh, 
log of our internet traffic for 12 months and make it available to any state agency that asks for it, pretty much. Now, that feels like a privacy violation because that's collecting my information to do so to build a profile of me as a, as a person rather than the, the commercial uses. And I, I wonder if you feel that there's, there is a difference here. I mean, clearly, you know, some of this behavior is illegal, but do we, is, it, is it helpful to call it privacy violation? Um, I, I think we have first, uh, you know, we identify what, what privacy is. And, and, and for many people, it has a different meaning and it depends a lot on our knowledge and also on the context, right, in which we apply this word privacy. Mm -hmm. Right. And as for computer scientists, we often, you know, translate it in something measurable. You know, it's something that you can say, OK, this is a problem. Why? Well, because this one identifier, you know, can trace me across the web. And so that's my a violation of my privacy. Right. Then there is a legal discussion, but I think you don't want to go there. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the legal discussion covers some aspects of our privacy, but probably not all of it. But. I think that's a sign. But there is, then there is, a, I think there is a certain, um, sometimes a certain kind of conflict, right, between privacy and security. And, and so far, many researchers in computer science have considered that privacy is just a subset of security because, oh, you just have to protect the confidential data and it's like a security problem. Yeah. But it's not. And your example actually demonstrates that, that the security agencies can collect data about the users, which is a privacy issue. Mm. Um, it is, but it's in conflict. The interest of the user protecting my privacy and the interest of the state protecting the security of, of the people, right? Because like, it, at least that's one of the goals, one of the purposes that <laughs> they think that they claim that they, this data is going to be used for. I mean, in this space, again, there is a, a big role is, who is playing the regulator. Um, so the, the data protection regulator I mean, we hear this, uh, that the regulator is observing the use of data in companies, but actually they are also observing the use of data everywhere else, including the government, including other agencies. I, I don't know if I answered your question. But, no, you, you did. I, yeah. I'll just explain the background, thought, yeah. which is, yeah. um, I think calling both the commercial use of tracking and also the state mandated collection mm. of data, both using the same label for them, allows an argument to be made, which is people mm -hmm. don't mind, people accept the cookie banners, people don't mind about the tracking. Some people do, but the majority of people mm. are, are, are willing to give up that data for convenience. And that then is, it quickly becomes an argument for, the, the state collecting data on people. Mm. And so there's a there's a sort of dark <sighs> in, in in the in built into the law there by you by building the two things in even the same label, the two things. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, I think I'm trying to resolve the first part of the problem. Yeah. Because I think that the people are, are not aware of what the data well, is collected and they are not aware that what happens when they click accept. Yeah. And, and so I'm trying to, to work on that space. And hopefully, I mean, I think there is a change. I think people are a bit more aware. And, and somebody even is saying that, oh, thanks to the GDPR, we have the banners everywhere that people get more aware. You know, there is even this kind of concept. And it's actually not thanks to GDPR, but well, that's a, you know, as I said, it's a combination of the two laws together. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah, I, I don't, I don't have much more to add, I think, but yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah. I, I, that's the kind of area I'm interested in, which is, mm, okay. I, sh I, should, I should point out that uh, for, for British researchers in your space, the job's going to get much harder soon because the new British data protection legislation will remove consent bans, the requirement for consent bans. Uh, and then what's, what's the legal basis then to use the data? They basically want they want to to allow commercial exploitation of uh, tracking. Um, so opt, opt out like the US. Yeah. Or oh, legitimate interest, I guess. Yeah. So so it's uh, there's, even though, there's, even though, about, well, there's a proposed there's a piece of legislation working its way through which will remove GDPR 
precisely to remove the barriers to commercial exploitation of user tracking data. There is a great paper actually coming up at Kai on legitimate interest. Okay. Yeah, where the okay. people have analyzed how users understand this legitimate interest issue. They did this in the context of cookie banners because yes. we have now the legitimate interest there as well. Uh, but yeah, yeah, have a look or, or let me know. I will send you the, the paper. It's I think it's really interesting in, in this in the space of the- UK That would be discussion. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right. Could, could you drop me just an email? I'll, I'll send it back to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I can facilitate that, yeah. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, 